So, you know, Chris Blackwell. <laughs> And I will say, you know, the, the influence was so predominant and pervasive in the culture that uh, while I was waiting for Chris to, um, to come off the plane, he flew in early this morning, he walks out of the gate and one of the, one of the kiosks in the airport is just blasting Bob Marley. You know? mm -hmm. I, of course, told him that I had set that. No, yeah, I but, uh, you must have been. Yeah, right. <laughs> Here's 20 bucks. <laughs> um, not the case. It's everywhere. So we're very, very fortunate to have someone here who um, I consider a fortunate enough to call a friend and grateful enough to call a mentor um, in my career. I've uh, worked with Chris uh, various times over the years, so it's, it's quite an honor and privilege to have him here. And I guess I'd like to start just because we have uh, an audience predominantly filled with uh, music industry students, um, with asking you right off the bat um, what type of advice you have for those people trying to get into the industry. Where do you start? How do you start? How did you start? Well, I, I started. Um, because, um, firstly, I always loved music. Um, and my musical education was initially classical music because my father was a big fan of uh, classical music. And uh, where we lived in Jamaica, there was a, a lot of sp space around. So he could play it incredibly loudly. So I grew up with very loud music, but it was like Brahms and Wagner and Verdi and Puccini. <clears throat> and I can't honestly tell you that I loved it that much at the time, but I'm sure that I absor absorbed it and uh, I guess sort of just innately took it in and uh, recognized what was really good music uh, of that period. Later on, when I went to school <clears throat> in England, I became friends with somebody who loved the music actually that came from this city right here. And so I sort of went from classical music to Jelly Roll Morton and uh, Pine Top Smith and uh, Albert Hammonds and all the music basically that came from here. <clears throat> and this was a music that for a long time I was totally stuck on. I really loved Louis Armstrong, of course. And then I kind of um, I kind of travelled up the Mississippi uh, uh, musically and started to like music from Chicago, and then I started to like music from New York. So I guess, you know, <clears throat> my musical taste was rooted in classics, and then in really the roots of, um, of popular music, which is from this city. <clears throat> so uh, I love music. So I think those different experiences helped me to recognize, I think, what was good and what was not so good. And um, though I never sort of was thinking about it as, uh, as a business to go into, it just happened because um, there was a band playing at a hotel. And um, I had a very good job at the hotel. I, was, I had the water ski concession. And teaching water skiing uh, is actually really a great um, uh, career. It has all kind of wonderful <laughs> perks. <laughs> perks. <laughs> However, I really liked, um, I really liked this music. <clears throat> and it was a, a blind pianist from Bermuda who was sort of Oscar Peterson-ish, but a bit more cocktail-ish. But it was, it was good. So <clears throat> for some, re some reason, I just felt that I just liked to record them. So I organized it, and I took the... Um, I took them into Kingston and we made a record. There was a, <clears throat> the guy who owned the studio was the engineer, and I just loved the whole process. Uh, it was in mono in those days, and you'd, you'd uh, you know, all the mixing was done when you recorded. You know, not like nowadays where you mix months or even years after you've recorded. <clears throat> so the mixing is actually done at the same time, and you know, at the end of a tune, you just hope that. Nobody made a sound because, again, in those days, everything was so, you know, you had to hear the last sound just die naturally and everything was just, just, just so. I don't think, I don't think music business is something to go into. Firstly, from a business point of view, I think it need, you need to go into it because you love music. And I think anybody who does love music, or in fact, anything particular, there's, there's, a, there's a great joy in turning somebody on to something. You know, have you heard this? You haven't heard this? Oh, this is great. You've got to listen to this. <clears throat> and that 
that whole experience is wonderful when you do play something to somebody or show them something or anything and they really like it. So going in the business is really just an extension of that. It's just that you're actually turning it into a, into a business and you're instead of it one by one people you're talking to you're finding a way to reach more people <clears throat> and uh, the real joy is what you love and what what you um, what you're interested in it, the, the real joy is when people embrace it a lot of people embrace it and um, if they don't embrace it then you know I, 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 I guess I was always sort of um, I was always feel that they would eventually and we've actually uh, from Ireland had a lot of artists who didn't sell a tremendous amount at the time their records came out. Nick Drake is one that immediately comes to mind <clears throat> but now sells more than he did you know per year now than he did at the time that he was around. So um, yes I guess that's a long answer to a short well, question. It's a, it's a great answer and you, you said an awful lot in there. Um, part, of, part of the challenge obviously for, for anyone in music is getting those people to hear it. It's, it's nice to hear someone of, of your stature say you know this is a, a marathon not a sprint. Um, today's culture seems to um, be one where everything has to happen right now immediately. Um, how, how have you managed to sustain through the, through the years, both you yourself and the artists that you've worked with, how do you, how do you help them during the times where it doesn't seem like it's going to happen? Are there, are there ways to, uh, to help? <clears throat> well, there's, you know, I, I just believe it really, the key thing is, is somebody needs to be strong live. A, a band, whether it's a band or it's an act, they need to be able to be strong live. The recording the recording is not the be all and end all. The recording is, is milestones. You know, the career is, your career can go on forever. Look at, look at Jimmy Buffett. He just had a number one record at 62 years old. The first record he's ever had at number one. Uh, I mean, if, if it, the records are just, are just milestones, they, they're something which hopefully widen your audience each time they come out. But it, 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 can't, it gets upside down if everything is a record and, uh, and, and you're not thinking about how you're actually making a connection live. And I think I've always thought that and, and now more than ever that is true since you know, the whole digital distribution and the erosion of, um, of like the top level of sales. <coughs> um, more than ever it's, it's, it's the live performance and when when, when that is the case, people, people are interested in the artist. They're interested in the artist. The record, as I say, is a, is a, is a milestone, is a byproduct of the artist, but they're really interested in the artist, so they buy into the artist. That's why people will want to buy a poster or buy a T-shirt, because they want, to, they want to sort of say, you know, I like this kind of music. This is what I'm into. This is part of me, just like people will have books on their shelf. It's a way it's sort of like a sort of type of clothes in a way, sort of saying what kind of person you are. Um, as one of the you know, few people of your stature who have <coughs> kind of vocally come out on the side of downloads, is it that? Do you see downloads as a, as a kind of uh, loss leader, maybe too strong of a word, but a, a way for artists to connect more easily and then um, be able to monetize their passion through their other materials? Is that where you fall on downloads? Yes. I mean, uh, I, at this point in time, I started another company in 1989, 1998, sorry, getting a bit dyslexic, <laughs> 1998, and um, it's been a, a difficult uh, period, an extraordinary <coughs> period over the last five years, five, six years. So I don't have any uh, artists signed to my company who are selling two, three, four, five million copies. So I can certainly afford to be very positive about peer-to-peer uh, -peer downloading, etc. Why? Because it's an incredibly efficient way of getting music out there. Before you'd have to, you know, manufacture a lot. You'd have to ship them to people. They'd pile up on people's desks. They'd never hear them. Now they go everywhere in the world at no cost. So you know, maybe if you have somebody who's only selling 30, 40,000 records, maybe they'll sell. 10, 20 instead of 30, 40. That, that, that doesn't matter to anybody. It's well worth it to get their name out there and get 
look at what they're doing out there and get it heard. So in that respect, I'm very, I'm very much for it. I think it would probably be harder to defend if I did have an artist who was selling five million records three or four years ago and was making a record of similar importance and relevance, and they only sold two or three now because that top end is taken off. Um, let's, let's move away a little bit to, to someone who he, he did uh, work with who sold many, many millions of records. And I think you know, Bob Marley's music means so much to so many people. Um, and I, I've always wondered, you know, it's the person responsible for bringing his music to these people. W what does his music mean to you? What, is it, what does it do to you to walk through an airport and hear, hear those songs? Oh, it's incredible. It must be. It's, uh, it's incredible. I, mean, it's, I, I thought you fixed it. That's the only thing. But now I know how you didn't fix it. No, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not that smart. You know? <laughs> No, it's incredible. I mean, Bob Marley's music and Bob Marley as an image has got absolutely everywhere. The most <coughs> amazing example to me was last year, I think it was, they were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the ascent of Everest. <coughs> uh, National Geographic had a big story about Nepal, and there was a picture in there of um, somebody playing pool in a pool hall in Nepal, and there was a huge poster of Bob Marley behind it. Mm. I thought it was it's unbelievable how does... How does, how is it that he's relevant that far away? Yeah. You know? um, and you produced Exodus, which which was you know talk about relevant. That was I believe it was Time's uh, record of the century. Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, Exodus. Yeah. Okay. Um, I should just clear. Well, none of his records I produced. I mixed in the records. He produced all the music on them. But there's only one track of Bob Marley I actually produced. But all the, <clears throat> all the others he um, produced, and he would give them to me to mix, and I'd mix them and give them to him to see if he okayed it. So I didn't, I didn't produce any. The only one I produced is actually a great one, and that is um, a redemption song. That's the only one I produced, because I'd heard his version of it, which was with a band, and I felt it would be much better just with him and guitar. So I talked him into doing it. He was a little reluctant. And how, how was that working relationship? I mean, you were one of the few people that he really trusted. And I think that, it, you know, it's an interest, I'm sure it's an interesting kind of story, but I think it's also important um, for people that are either artists on, or people on the other side of the coin, on the label side, that trust factor. You've, you've talked a lot about keeping your word and those types yeah. of things that are important. How did you, how did you develop that type of rapport with, with Marley? <coughs> well, it, it started really at the beginning, and it had to start at the beginning. What, it was a, a strange circumstance. I'd worked with Jimmy Cliff for a long time, and, uh, and then Jimmy had an offer to sign to another label, and they were giving him an advance, I think it was a $50,000, and I said, no, don't take that 50000 you should stay with Island Records, you'll do better with us. So <clears throat> I talked him out of doing the deal. It was with RCA Victor he was going to do that. And then I got a call from a friend of mine who was making this film, The Harder They Come, and he'd seen the, the cover of a single that I'd put out of Jimmy. Um, and he said, that's the character I want for the film. And I thought it would be a very good move for Jimmy to do that, good career move for him to do it. So I told Jimmy he should do that. Well, a film takes a long time, and you get very little money for a film. It takes a long time. So he didn't make any record during that period. He just <coughs> was really doing the film. So. The extension that he gave me was a year or 18 months or something. At the end of that year or 18 months, I indeed had not earned for him as much as he would have got if he'd gone somewhere else. And so he was sort of upset with me, felt I'd left, let him down, <coughs> and uh, signed to somebody else. And I was devastated because I sort of knew exactly what to do. The harder they come, in a way, set up reggae music. It's, it, it, it set it up as a kind of character. It, it, gave, it gave the context from which the, that music emerged. And um, so he left. I was really upset. Then w literally within a week, somebody rang me and said, uh, Bob Marley and the Whalers are in town. And this was London. Um, would you like to see them? So I said, yeah, sure. So the other people in the, I'd, I'd released some of their records before, but I never met them. <clears throat> I released Bob's first record, in fact. In fact, I printed his name wrong on the, on the label <laughs> because I, mis, I misread it and 
uh, it was issued one cup of coffee by Robert Morley. Oh. I remember it because Robert Morley was a very fey English actor. <laughs> uh, it was, couldn't have been sounded, sounded so weird. Anyhow, so I hadn't met him, but there was a, you know, a word, I don't know who, who of you have seen The Harder They Come, <clears throat> but you know, it was the Jamaican music business. Somebody was paid like 10 shillings or a pound to do a song, and that was it. It could sell thousands and thousands. They'd never see anything more. And Bob and Peter Tosh and Bunny Whaler, the three of them were, nobody would touch them. They wouldn't deal with them. They wouldn't deal with it. It was very bad, very negative, you know. So when people even heard they were coming in, they said, you shouldn't meet with these guys. They're really, really bad news, etc." Well, anyhow, they walked in the office, and you know there was like the real thing. There was the harder they come, there there they were, the three of them. <clears throat> and um, so I ch chatted with them for a bit, and I asked them how much they <laughs> thought it would cost them to make a record that I was interested in, a, in an album, that the way I saw them would be like a black rock group. They at the time were more interested in trying to get an, an American R&B because they're, the only association they had with the music business was through uh, Johnny Nash. Mm -hmm. They knew Johnny Nash, Bob had written a song for Johnny Nash, and so that was their world where they felt that their best sh shot to succeed would be in the R&B charts. Uh, Island was really a rock label, and I saw them as a rock act. I didn't see them having any chance of appealing to black America. I thought they would appeal more to, you know, college kids, white college kids, college kids of, from wherever, in fact. So I, I, I felt that they, would, they should be sort of positioned in the same market as Ireland was strong in at the moment, because at that time we had uh, well, some of the acts you just mentioned, mm -hmm. you know. So I said, um, I said to them, how much do you think it will cost you to, to make a, a whole album? And they tell me. And I said, OK, I'll give you a check to do that. And everybody said, you're crazy. You'll never see that money again. <clears throat> That's gone. But I felt that the only way to work with them was to trust them. And uh, <clears throat> that's really what happened. And so that's how the relationship started, and that's how it stayed all the time. So you developed trust with them mm -hmm. from the start, and that, that fortified the relationship for years right. to come. Um, I have to talk about Tom Waits, um, just because uh, he's, he's you know, one of my heroes, someone I've been fortunate to get to know. Um, you took a real chance with him, um, mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, and uh, it seems that that relationship epitomizes how uh, creative freedom mixed with support can lead to critical and, and commercial success. Um, you started working with him after he had parted ways with his prior label because he wanted to make his own records, produce his own records. Yeah. And you gave him that freedom, which resulted in, in Swordfish Trombones, which uh, very, very important record. I don't know if it was Time's record of the century, but uh, certainly mm. George's record of the century. So. Mm. <laughs> what, uh, what was that like? How, how did that? Well, I'll tell you what happened there. He, he'd made Swordfish Trombone, in fact. <coughs> Um, he'd, he'd made it and it was turned down by Electra. Mm -hmm. They didn't want it. And again, I'd heard from somebody that he was, um, had been turned down by Electra. And I loved, I, lo I just loved the character. Yeah. And so I flew out to Los Angeles and I met with him. And at that time he was very um, uh, introverted. In fact, if his wife had not been there, I don't know how one could have had any conversation at all because he didn't say Same. one word the entire, the entire time. But we made a, we made a deal. We, we met, met somewhere in the uh, Las Filas area of Los Angeles. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, we made a deal. And you know, somebody like Tom Waits is somebody you really, you know, you just try and give a platform to, give, make, make them feel comfortable, where they feel they can call you if they have a problem or need any help or anything, but you don't, you don't really direct Tom Waits. You just really provide a platform. So I can't understand how one could turn down a record of Tom Waits because, again, you know, the way I think is uh, records are, as I said, milestones. 
Some are better than others, but you don't really tell somebody of a talent like that what kind of record to make, in my opinion. I think there's such a deep message in, in you know, the things that you said about Marley, the things you said about weight. I'll have to obviously ask you about you too in a second, but there seems to be this sense of you know, finding great people and letting them do their thing. I think, um, as I was saying when we were talking earlier today, I think <clears throat> we're at a time now where there are virtually no independent labels. Uh, for most of the record business, there are a lot of independent labels. <coughs> at the moment, when I say they're no, there are in fact actually thousands of independent labels, but all of them are, are really tiny. So there isn't really, like when there was Ireland, Virgin, Chrysalis, A&M, there, there, there are no labels like that anymore. And so the record business is pretty much geared to the financial world. It's geared to getting the fastest return possible because that's how the financial world operates. Um, and the only way to do that is to have a single, have a video, pump it out there, sell it like an, some new commodity, and um, you know, hope it sticks. And if it doesn't sell, you drop the act. So I think that's, that's why we're not seeing many people emerging out of the current industry as people who we feel will be there for a long period of time. Because they're not given enough time because the, the record labels have to report to the banks on a quarterly basis and it just doesn't... And everybody, everybody's in such a hurry. Yeah. You know, How do we what's the hurry? The thing is this is that mystery is the most precious thing to have. You know, once there's mystery. no mystery, yeah, in anything. Once there's no mystery, then it's next. Right. You know, right. so once somebody happens and everybody's technically doing their job, the manager, the agent, the publicity, the rec if they get them on every magazine, but what do you want to be on every magazine for? Mm, so interesting. It's ridiculous. So how do we combat that? Well, how do we combat that? Well, you can only go your own way. And you know, I'm, you're talking to me, this is just my way. I'm not saying it's the right way. It's the way that works for me. So it's, you know, it's different for, for everybody. There, 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 there are some labels, there are some people I've been talking to recently who you know, have little labels that have the kind of spirit like you did when, uh, you know, with your label. You had, uh, he was a nightmare to work with <laughs> because he was so passionate about his act. He was fighting for it all the time, you know, and, and that's, that's what you have to be. And it's very hard to get that in a large company. It's, it's so full of politics and, you know, people being nervous of allying themselves that's to something which might be a failure in case they get tainted with that failure. And, and so, you know, it's just at the time when just the time when somebody needs help is where they get abandoned because mm -hmm. people don't want to be tainted with it. Is so. it a good time or a bad time to be a music business entrepreneur right now? Well, it depends what level. If you're just starting, it's a good time. Why? If you've been there for a long time, it's probably not a bad time. Can you elaborate on that? Well, no, I'll, I, I, I consider myself an exception to that. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, why? <laughs> because I think it's, it's changed. Everything is changing completely. It's completely, completely changing um, in terms of the business side of the music. So I think people starting now can feel that and can feel where it's going. Right. People who've been doing something for a long time traditionally are nervous of change. Yeah. Um, as the person who launched U2's career, um, taking a chance on a band that had been rejected by every other major label. I'm not sure how many people are aware of that, that everyone passed on you too. Mm -hmm. um, how do you explain their ability to continue to be relevant and to make what I consider, and I think a lot of other people agree, some of the most inspiring and impassing music of their career 25, 30 years into it? Well, <clears throat> they're really an exception, I have to tell you. You know, with most, most uh, things you look at, the deeper you get into them, the shakier they get. In the case of YouTube, the deeper you get into it, the stronger they are. They're absolutely incredible people. I've, I've had, um, I've worked with them from, and when I say worked with them, I did very little work. It's only recently that I realized that I contributed somewhat, and that contribution was by doing actually nothing. <clears throat> but you know, I stayed out of the way and, and gave them a, a platform. But I believed in them when I met them. I believed in them as personalities. 
Even and though you didn't like their music? I didn't take to the music, no. Not, not when I first heard them. Because I, I like bass and drum. Right. You know, and they're, 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 it was rinky-dink, in my opinion, at that time. So <laughs> I didn't hear it, you know, what can I tell you? But I, I did see them. I believed in them. And um, so I just went to my company and said, look, let's just follow these guys. You know, let's be a platform for what they want to do. And then about 18 months after that, there was somebody I had running Island Records, and they needed $80,000 tour support, I remember. You too did? Yeah. And as usual, we were short of cash, because that's the other thing. When you're independent, you're always short of cash. Um, and um, so he came to me, and he said, you know, sir, I, think we should, I don't think we should do this. I mm -hmm. said, what do you mean? He said, well, <clears throat> I don't think we should do it. This, the first record was good, but the second record didn't do as well as the first record, and I don't know if they're really kind of happening now. And, you know, we, can, we could just let them go and just not put up the $80,000. And, um, you know, obviously we, we kept them, and uh, I said, you know, it was just ridiculous. But, you know, again, it's, it's, it's difficult if you have a job. I don't think I would have lasted if I had a job, you know. I, I really don't. I think it's very difficult because you have to produce quickly. Sure. You know, if you get a job as an A&R guy, you start the next first day and then everybody wants to know what have you signed and how is it selling. And you tell them, well, it's not selling this year, but it'll sell in three or four years' time. They don't want to know about that. You say you don't have a job. You're an entrepreneur. You start companies right. and you run them, so you have the freedom to. Well, it's a chicken and egg. You know, I'm probably mm -hmm. unemployable. <laughs> Chris, Chris, do you think that the uh, the current business, the creative enterprise, is inconsistent with the way business is done today in the music world? I think with the majors, the majors are really suffering. Now. They're suffering big time because you see that that's a their whole process is like I said earlier. Sign something pay a huge amount of money for everything, you know, to sign them, to beat the other guys, to make the video, to do this, to do that, to do the other. And if they, if they get it right, the top is creamed off because, no, you know, with, with the downloading, a, a lot of revenue is lost. There's no question. A lot of revenue is lost off the big hits. So they no longer, if they have something which was, let's say, Usher's record, I don't know what it sold, let's say it sold eight, 8 million copies or something. That maybe you've sold 10 or 12 million copies. Well, that extra two or four million copies is 20 to 40 million dollars of revenue that the company is not getting, which covers all the, all the other problems they have. So what they're doing now, they're all stripping back, stripping back, stripping back the overhead. But all, all of it is little people who make all the difference, actually. The sales guy, the local sales guy here, or the local promotion person there. The people with the large, big salaries are still staying there. It's, all, it's just the little guys are getting cut out. And so the result is now they're really not effective at all. Whereas before you say, well, the good thing about a major, they have a couple of people in this city and a couple of people in that city who can do it. They don't have them anymore. They don't have anybody. They're like an empty shell. So it's got to change completely, you think, before it gets better? I think so, but I think I think independence. I think independence will change it. In, independence and 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 the use of the internet for distribution of, of information and of the product itself. The innovation will always come from the independent field, right? Well, it it always has, has because you know, you know, if somebody's been in, struggled all their way and they're the top of the company, you know, it's it's there's no upside for them to come up with something new. Is what, I mean, is what music is exciting you today? <coughs> Projects? Well, there's a guy who I'm, I'm just sort of getting back into music, actually. I haven't really been into it that much recently. Um, there's a guy who I really like who I'm going to be working with, um, who I'm sure is toured here, called Michael Franti. Has anybody heard of him? Spearhead? Mm. Well, I, I love him because he's got, you know, there's Again, there's, there's a point of view to his right. singing. And also, I'm actually really interested to work with a group which I want to call the Marley Brothers, which is actually the five sons of Bob Marley. And they were on tour recently. And I think, I think 
what they've been doing, they've all been making records on their own, <coughs> which have two or three good tunes on them. And I think if they put all their energies into this one entity, right? So all the, all the songs went into that. I'm trying to get them to, you know, to sign just, just for three years, just put all their energy into one thing just for three years, and then thereafter. But it's a little hard to, to get it all together, because one is being offered something here, and another is being offered something there. That's what I'm trying to do. You having fun? Yeah. Always. Some days. If you have a question, why don't you come up to the microphone and, and please ask it. Scott? Scott? I'll go first. <laughs> Hi, it's a real pleasure to have a chance to talk with you. Um, we're all big admirers. Um, apropos of what you were mentioning earlier about uh, the state of the music industry and new technologies, I heard a story on uh, television news this morning that kind of shocked me, and I was wondering what your take on it was. Um, the band U2 is releasing a new album that they are distributing on iPods, buy an iPod, and it comes preloaded with a new U2 record. I was wondering, considering your relationship with the group and the music industry, what you thought about that. Well, you know, they have been very reluctant to have any sponsorship ever. Uh, and it's a big thing with them. And iPod, they love iPod. I don't know about you, I, I love iPod. I mean, I'm a huge Steve Jobs groupie. Because, and I am, I think, I think anybody who, who, who designs, you know, the design of his products is so great, but also behind it, the, it, the, it, it functions so efficiently. It's not just design over function, they, they both really work big time. Um, I think they just love iPod. And uh, this opportunity came up, which was actually put together by Jimmy Iovine, who's head of uh, Interscope, and you two now work with Jimmy Iovine in America. And um, it was really an idea of his, which took about a year to put together. And um, I saw it, I, the first thing I saw, I saw it on iTunes, I don't know if anybody has that, but, but there is a whole video that you two do of their new song, Vertigo, in the, in, in the same design as the whole iPod ads and the iPod campaign. So I, I view it very positively. I mean, I've been reading a lot of stuff to some people who are negative about it, saying, well, iPod have sold out because they've done a commercial. But I don't, I don't see it like that at all. I think, I think you don't feel with that particular product, or I don't, that somebody is selling it and getting paid money to sell it. You feel that they are also sort of just collaborating with it. Well, it's, if they love the product, they genuinely love the product, then that's great. I certainly have no quibble with that. I'm not an iPod user myself, but I don't blame them if, if they love the product. And right. even if they want to do commercials for it, I don't, don't mind. Right. Uh, I guess I'm more curious about the business model of releasing a new album on a, a broadcast or, a, or a, a reproduction medium and what that means for the technology and new delivery devices and new album formats and whether you had uh, any thoughts on how, uh, is this the start of something else that will we'll now be re buying refrigerators pre-stocked with beer? <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, That's a good idea. <laughs> uh, well, no, I think, I think, I think um, as you said, you saw it on TV this morning, so it's a kind of idea which would get on TV and therefore let everybody be uh, aware that you two have a new record out. So it has tremendous marketing value. But it's, that's just part of the, a, a part of the, the idea. You know, it's just to, it's impractical. I mean, we could talk about, um, you know, as big a fan as I am of Steve Jobs, he's not, in my opinion, the savior of the record business because, I mean, you're going to have to download an awful lot of, nobody can afford to fill an iPod with uh, uh, legal music. You know what I mean? You, you just can't afford it. You can, it, it. <laughs> so you've got, to, you've got to download it. But So there's an association where iPod are, are, are promoting the tour, promoting the record, they're promoting iPod, you know. And this is a, just an idea. This is just an idea. It's not, it's not like it's just being released on that. It's just a way you could buy it. Advance? Yes, it's the hmm. record only available on iPod for a certain amount of time and before it's the regular release. I don't know about that. 
if, if, I'd be surprised if that's the case. Is that not the case? That's what I thought I heard. Oh. Well, I'm surprised about that. Uh, I have two questions. The first is very curious that I've been, uh, wondered about this for years. There's a wives' tale. Well, legend has it that uh, when Bob Marley first had some commercial success, uh, he, being somewhat left-leaning, he took a lot of heat for going out and buying an $80,000 BMW. And his response was that it stood for Bob Molly and the Whalers. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if there's any truth to that. That's that. absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the other is, um, I, I represent the state in, in economic development for the entertainment industry. And one of my thoughts when we came out with these incentives for the movie business to drive the movie business, that it would naturally drive the music business. They'd come here, discover you know, the music, and use it in their movies. It really hasn't taken off like that, and I'm just curious what advice you could give to make that happen more in getting the music in the movies, in that we've gone through an explosion in the state. We've gone from 30 million in production to over 200 million. But yet, when, you know, except for the movie Ray coming out next week, and most of that was done out of the state, does it take incentives? Does it just have to be written into the script? What, what would it take to get that world to recognize the music that included in movies? I think, I think the, the music really, the, 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 the movie has to be set in an environment where the music f fits it particularly. Because they may be coming down here to, to film for, I don't know where they're filming, but they may be filming because of scenery or because of, I, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know what. But in terms of getting the music into the, into the story, it has to be, it has to be set in a location where that music really, um, you know, fits. Really, it's not. It's not. It's not um, just um, um, tax incentives and things. It wouldn't be that because it just it wouldn't work for some, you know, for certain stories. You have you have you have to have the music which works for that film. Thanks a lot for coming to New Orleans and being here. Um, I've had a, cousins that had an independent label and have a client that has an independent label now. And I hear, I've heard the same thing from both of them in terms of uh, cash flow being squeezed by the distributors and problems with distributors. And could you talk a little bit about that? Is that something you experienced and what causes that and how that could possibly be fixed? The only way to fix it <coughs> is to come up with something that the distributor wants. Unfortunately, that's a, a factor of, of existence, you know, is that, is that if you, um, again, earlier we were talking and I was <coughs> explaining that what puts independent companies out of business more than anything else is having a hit. Because when you have a hit, you don't collect from your distributor because they're used to, let's say you, let's say you have a specialist label or a certain kind of business, uh, which does business with a distributor $1,000 a month, let's say. If you have something which is a hit, and suddenly in a month you do $10,000, you're not going to collect that other $9,000 <coughs> until you have something else which is going to want them to uh, really have to deal with you. And it's just a fact. It's just as one of the, you know, it's just, it's just a fact. Nothing to do with the law. It's just. <laughs> A fact. Yeah. I mean, as you're saying, I mean, distribution follows marketing. A lot of people mm -hmm. think they get a distribution deal and their problems are over. It's often the, the, the end. You know, record yeah. business is a pull through business, not a push through business. You've got to make people right. pull the, the titles out. So tell them they just need another, another, another one the distributors want, then they'll pay them. <laughs> That's exactly what they said. <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep giving them records in order to stay in business. That's right. I was just wondering, um, there's a huge connection. I, if you listen to reggae music and New Orleans music, there's huge similarities. And I'm wondering if you ever thought about getting some musicians from Jamaica and New Orleans now and actually make a record. Um, that's a good idea. It's, it's been a, also a good, a good idea. We've been good from 40 years ago, too. The, in Jamaica, we heard a, a lot of music from New Orleans, the kind of music that was played by the sound systems. Because reggae is probably the only music that was born in a studio. 
It was never, you, you would never hear reggae played in clubs and bars and even live. The music in Jamaica, the whole music scene in Jamaica started with sound systems. And sound systems would play uh, R&B records. <coughs> and the labels that they liked were, a lot of them were from here. Imperial Records was a big uh, label that they liked. Fats Domino was on Imperial. Fats Domino was the biggest star in Jamaica. And a lot of his music was, did have a kind of shuffle rhythm. The, and the ska, ska, which was a sort of the, what the, the music was called before reggae, really is, is shuffle, except the accent is on, you know, on a different, uh, yeah. So, yes, it, could, it probably could have made sense, and probably maybe still could. But um, <clears throat> the influence is there, that it's New Orleans music was very influential to Jamaican music. It was Jamaicans trying to play like New Orleans, but just having that uh, calypso in the blood, I guess. Interesting. Over here, you had a question? Yeah, big fan of yours. Just wanted to say I appreciate getting yeah. the chance to hear you talk. I guess I was just kind of wondering what happens when someone sends you or gives you a record. How many do you get a week, a day? Do you listen to it ever? Do you listen to it if you like the cover, if you like the name? Do you listen to it if there's somebody's name attached to it that you know about? I mean, what happens if I was to send you a fancy CD <laughs> or give you one today? <laughs> I mean, well, now you know, what would be, how would I? Well, now it's it. much easier nowadays because of my little machine there, I can just put it on and rip it, I think is the term. And then I have it on the computer and I listen to it. It's very easy now. I can do that in a plane, whereas before you couldn't really do that. So um, <clears throat> I sometimes you get a lot, and it, it really it it is. Uh, uh, I guess you're, you're you're probably asking in general, not just with me in particular. In 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 general, it is best to go through somebody to give it to give it straight to um, to give it straight to like a head of A and R or somebody. They probably never get around to listening to it. In most cases, they, they don't. They may put it on because there's something on the cover or something that you know, makes them pick it up. But in general, it's very hard to just get something directly to somebody who can make a, make a decision. It usually has to go through somebody that they know or something. And that's why a lot of people get managers ahead of time, and the manager knows somebody. And then <clears throat> but all the knowing somebody business is disappearing. The internet is getting rid of all the middlemen away. You know, now you have to bring added value as a middleman. Otherwise, I don't think you're going to exist for long. So anyhow, what happens if I get them, I, I put them right on there, and I don't have to carry anything. It's on there. I can, <coughs> it's, um, and then I listen to them. Are you asking, I mean, a question of, of you know, how someone with a band, how do you get the attention of a label? And we've talked about this a lot. I mean, there's a certain element of having to, to rise up above in order to, to create the attention, just sending an unsolicited demo in. Is that kind of what you're saying is not perhaps the best way to no. do it? There's you know, other ways. I think, look, I mean, if, 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 if somebody has a band, right, and they love doing, do, doing what they're doing, that's the first thing, right? They have to really love doing what they're doing because it's hard work. If, if it's work, it's hard, right? If you love it, then it's not work. <clears throat> and then, basically, nowadays you can be your own record company. You can be your own record company until something there is such a, a, a there's a sufficient demand for something that somebody comes to you because they've heard about it. And how do you get them to hear about it? You just use the internet. You use the internet to get it out there. You use the internet to tell people to come to the club that you're playing. <clears throat> you set up. There, there was an act. There was an act that I was after a few years ago, and uh, I went to see him. And he, I, I'm not going to say his name because maybe something great has happened with him. I'm not, I'm not sure. <clears throat> but anyhow, I went to see him, and he was really good. He was fantastic. I went to see him in Rhode Island, and the place was full. And I'd never heard of him before. Um, and, you know, he wasn't known. He never released a record or anything. So I talked with him afterwards, <clears throat> and I said, "Well, how you know? How do you? How long have you been playing?" He's been playing a couple of years, 
I said, well, how come there are so many people there? He said, well, you know, I have emails of everybody when we play anyway, we ask people to sign up. And so they send out an email <coughs> to all the people when he goes on tour. And uh, this place had about, I don't know, 800 people or something like that. So um, I said to him, I said, well, I, I, don't, I don't think there's anything much I can do for you. I think what you, you are the model of to, tomorrow's recording artist. You own your own copyrights, you own your own record, <coughs> you're playing to an audience, the audience is growing all the time. Anyhow, a major company came in and, and everybody jumped on it, trying to sign him. And one company ended up giving him a fortune. And when I say a fortune, they gave him two million dollars. This kid was 20 years old, right? I know he's so, talking. Yeah. Should I mention the name? So how uh, the manager, he did his job, right? He got the kid $22 million. The agent, everybody involved technically did their job. But then the record company who'd put up $2 million <coughs> suddenly wanted the record to sound how they wanted the record. They didn't want him to do what he was doing and would continue to doing for probably the rest of his life. He had like a nervous breakdown, and I don't know what happened to him. He maybe has emerged through it all and is doing, you know, actually? He's doing okay. Should, oh. we, should we mention it? Howie Day? Is that Howie Day. Yeah. Yeah. Have you heard of him? Howie, Howie Day. He's doing fine. He's doing fine? Oh, good. Okay, that's good. That's good. All right, well, that's it. I was just saying that I was concerned because I thought that what he was doing was great and it's very hard to turn down a huge amount of money like that but I think you'd have been better off if he just kept the ownership of everything he has and just kept it he would own his catalogue in perpetuity he would, he would own everything he would be in charge of his life the worst is to just lose control of your life Chris but can you talk a minute about the visual earlier today you were talking about the importance of visual in today's music world could you mention that again well, it's become, it's, become, it's become important, but, you know, I was very keen on it at first, but in general I'm not so keen on it now, because I think, I think it's distorted everything. I think, it's, I think it's tended to focus everything on like a single, and, uh, and the experience of seeing a band, like a concert on television, doesn't really make it somehow, you know. Live concert is so incredible, but a concert on TV never really makes it, so then what does make it on TV is a video. <clears throat> Especially, in my opinion, rap videos. I think r rap videos are fantastic because <clears throat> they're like five-minute superstars. And, and, you know, the imagery and, the, and, and everything of it, I, th I think that's an incredible medium <clears throat> for rap videos. But I think, I think it's sort of caused everybody to focus, as I say, on the single. So the single gets a whole lot of production. The single is supposed to make you to buy the album. You buy the album, and then in a lot of cases, the rest of the album is disappointing. So you overall feel that you've been had a little bit, you know, that you've paid a lot of money for what you expected would be 10 great songs, but there are only really two great songs. And that's why we've ended up in this process of people talking about downloading singles and not buying into artists. It's a joy listening to you speak. It's really great. My name's Ali, and um, among other things, I'm engaged in setting up a shoot in New Orleans and Memphis for your boys, Jamie and Duncan, of One Giant Leap. Really? Great. Yeah, which is really <coughs> And um, I don't know how many people know about One Giant Leap, but there's these two. How many people know about One Giant Leap? Okay, a few. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe you want to talk about that a little bit, but... Um, my question is, basically, these are two guys who go around doing fabulous musical collaborations around the world, and so I've been thinking a lot about matters of indigenous music and setting this up, and um, I think the thing that has really struck me about their music, which is so wonderful, is that they'll take a drummer from Uganda and a singer from Nepal and a didgeridoo player from Australia and combine them onto one track, and somehow the integrity of each of those genres is retained, which is wonderful. And um, I'm, I'm from New Zealand, and on the first One Giant Leap documentary, George Nuku, who's a Māori artist, talks about the fact that young Māori people 
don't really want to be Polynesian, they don't want to be Māori, they want to be African American, they want to be P. Diddy, you know, right. which um, not wanting to malign my beloved adopted country, but I think that, you know, the Americanization of the world's cultures is a great tragedy. And so my question is, which I'm finally getting to, is how do you see the future of, um, of indigenous musical forms? How, how much hope is there that, that the diversity will be retained especially in light of the kind of terrible fear of impending doom that, that record companies have, you know, so they're always wanting to, to take a safe bet rather than take a risk. Well, <clears throat> I again come back to basic, I think, I think live performance. I think if you see King Sunny a day live, you know, you've just got to love the music, you know. I, I, I think also you, it's got to be your expectations have got to be um, more narrow, in a sense, because once, once people are singing in a different language, for those of us who speak English, right? Because obviously, um, you know, a, a lot of the countries buy English-speaking music in, 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 in huge volumes. But for those of us who speak English, we're spoilt with the fact that that's, the, that's the, the language. So when people are singing in another language, I think that immediately puts you in more in the jazz world, in a sense, because you are then comparing an artist, let's say Salif Keita, his voice is an is a instrument. It's really an instrument. You're, you're more listening to instrumental music than, than vocal music because there's no longer a, a word element that you can understand. So that, that will limit it itself to its p potential, unless, again, there is something which has got a remix as a, as a dance record, and then that has its own flaws, because you can, you, you have, um, uh, who was the guy who had Yeki Yeki? I can't remember. Papa Wemba. Mm. Papa Wemba is a fantastic artist. Is it Papa Wemba? I think it's it. And he had, he had a song which was remixed for clubs called Yeki Yeki, which sold like two million copies. So people went to buy the album, and the rest of the album has nothing to do with that. It was a pure studio, manuf you know, manufactured thing for dance, dance floor. I think, I think in digital music, at, at the moment, I'm, I'm actually talking with some kind of, it sounds very sort of uh, High powered, but I don't know if it is that high powered. But it's with world, some elements of the World Bank who are wanting to put money into African music. And I told them that I thought the best way to do it was not to put it in the recording process, but to put it in the support of touring. And especially, um, you know, spending some time with the immigration authorities. <laughs> <laughs> Since September the 11th, most of these guys can't really travel too easily because their names are all a string of consonants. So, um, so that's what um, I don't think. I think it'll get stronger. Actually, I think it'll get stronger. And personally, how I'd love to see it, I would love to see it actually mixed with well-known jazz artists because mm -hmm. I think it would be good for both music, for the world music, and for jazz. Well, the, the rap entrepreneurs, it's, 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 uh, that's really been the biggest revolution, really, in, in, in music, that whole element, just, just because of the, the natural entrepreneurial spirit really exists there. It's, 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 I, I, I don't know whether it's because it's, um, I don't know, whether it's, it's more to do with words and not so much to do with um, musicianship and things. So there is, so, so it's, it, it, people who uh, can be entre entrepreneurial have great, uh, have ideas, let's say, 
and they can express and express that and get that across without having to to be trained in music to write a song or to play. I don't know whether that's the reason. I'm not sure that it attracts more entrepreneurs. But there are no entrepreneurs anything like the rap world, which have come from the rock world. None, none at all that I can think of. It's it's true. I actually never thought of thought about it like that before. But it definitely is the case. And in terms of XM, I, d I don't I don't know how it's. I don't know as yet how it's doing. I must say I'm a little bit out of it. I was, I was unsure how well it would do, but I hear it is doing pretty well. Because uh, I thought it would, um, I, I, th I thought that most people like to listen to local radio. So I thought it would only be long distance truck drivers who would, uh, I could see them driving across you know, America and being able to listen to the same thing. But I, I didn't, I didn't realize, I didn't feel that it would happen amongst, you know, everybody. But I understand it really is. I'm not sure. As, as long as we have you, I'd, I'd like to ask you about your experiences in the movie business, because Island was involved in the production and distribution of lots of great movies in the 70s and 80s. And I know that Palm is also involved. And uh, independent film distribution can be kind of a thankless world. And I was wondering if you could talk about your experiences in it. Well, um, with Ireland, we started with a film called Koyan Iskatsi. I don't know if you know Koyan Iskatsi. It's a not a regular kind of a film. Um, and we came at a, we, we started at a really, uh, really a good time. We started just before video came in. And there was nobody at that time releasing um, sort of independent film for a sort of more of an adult audience. And I don't mean uh, adult in the, you know, <laughs> the grown-up audience, let's say. Um, and we, I, I brought somebody on who was a, um, a distributor, one guy. And so we set ourselves up as a distribution company. Even though it was only four or five of us, I said, well, you know, again, it's sort of semantics. If you call yourself a distributor, um, if, then you are already gone from being one of 10,000, uh, which are 10,000 producers, to being one of maybe 50 film companies. So already you've sort of elevated yourself just by changing a word. But in order to, for the word to mean anything, you have to have somebody who is good at marketing and distributing. And we had somebody who was very good, a guy called Carrie Brokaw. He came and he ran um, Island Alive initially, which then uh, emerged into Island Pictures. Now, what we did was we acquired most of our pictures. We didn't produce many. We produced uh, Choose Me, Alan Rudolph's film, Choose Me. But most of the things we acquired. And I soon found out that even in the film business, people don't know, even in the film industry, people were unaware of what you produce and what you acquire. Now, there's a, huge, there's a huge difference. When you're going to produce a film, you have an idea of what you think the film, how the film could come out. Very rarely does it come out as you hope, because there's so many different elements. There's such a huge team required. And if one actor doesn't work, then you have to cut around them. And when you cut around them, then it's like dominoes, in a sense, then, because every line in a script is there for a reason. So if you have to cut around somebody, then it starts to fall apart. So right now, with Palm Pictures, we're not producing hardly anything. We're acquiring virtually everything. Um, so when you're doing that, what it means is you're seeing something, it's finished. And then the bet you're making is, is whether you feel that you're going to be able to distribute it and reach the audience that you feel um, it could reach. So. It's mainly acquiring. And in terms, of, in, in terms of the distribution side being difficult, if, if, if you're kind of if you're f small and consistent, the, sa the same story, uh, as I said earlier, would apply, incidentally. If you suddenly had a film which did uh, you know, $10 million, you're going to have difficulty collecting um, you know, a lot of that um, excess amount from what your normal business is. But, uh, DVD also has changed the whole process, because I view uh, releasing a film 
uh, in cinemas as an act touring, you know, and then the DVD is available as to buy and have at home. So. Um, even though, even though uh, in the recent years the internet has uh, been blamed for a lot of loss of sales, it seems to me that uh, the demise of small labels and of the diversity of available music could also be uh, correlated to the, uh, the chaining, the clear channeling of uh, the radio business. And I'm wondering if we could uh, model an American system like the Canadian content system to demand that a certain amount of the airwaves in each state be given to that state so that Louisiana music could be played in Louisiana up to a given percentage every year on every radio station. Well, I, uh, I think it's a good idea. I think, it's a, I think anything to encourage something to, to have a start and a base. Because, you know, the model that I believe in is you start something small, you have an act that is playing in a club, the first people are the, uh, you need to please are the people who come into that club. And then you grow it from there. So the, the same would apply. If, if you know that you've got a good chance of support, because a radio station in your, in your state is supportive of music that's made there, that absolutely, I think, is a great idea. It would help because it expands it then from your club to that town to the other towns in that state. And actually, interesting, just to get back to you two on something, is that um, you know they, they always say that every decision they make to this day, they make with the, the thought in mind of what would the first 20 people who were their fans say about it? Would they, would they say that they, you know, when they were doing the right thing or would they say they got a bit corny or sold out or something? So they, they've, always, they've always thought like that. Still the biggest things they still think, well, what, really, what, what would those guys say? <laughs> so it's great. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. With so many artists today with the internet bypassing record labels, do you see record labels possibly moving, expanding into areas they haven't traditionally done, such as uh, booking, uh, managing, that sort of thing? Where do you see that headed? I can see independent record labels doing that <coughs> because as a human being, that they're dealing with, but I can't see it with large corporations because they're, they're, it's it's um, for an artist they're they they they're, they're putting too much of their life into um, different employees. Do you know what I mean? And the large you can't you couldn't imagine Sony doing it. It would be very difficult for them to do it. How would they how would they do it? Do you know what I mean? Because they're such a huge company that we have to be ahead of something there, ahead of something there. <coughs> And it's all in one pot, and and then the funds are all intermingled and cross collateralized. So it, 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 uh, an artist doesn't have the opportunity then to reach out somewhere and get some funds for this or for for um, for live <coughs> performance or for the merchandising or something. But I think in a small company, in fact, you know the the model that we we are doing is something where we are doing short term contracts. Um, just two project contracts rather than what is normally six, six album contracts. We're just doing two, we call them project because a project is a CD and a DVD and we ha have an interest in everything. The live performance during the period that, that, that they're doing live <coughs> um, shows, <coughs> the music publishing, the merchant, any merchandising which is involved with the um, with the imagery connected with those two projects, just for that. So you can't obviously do that for a long period of time. You can do it for a, sh a short period of time. A long period of time, you can't anybo ask anybody to go and put their trust of their whole everything into one place. But for a short period of time, you can do that. Chris, I want to thank you so much. For I have your one more question. Oh, yeah. But first of all, Leon, you want to have, ask something and then? Very quick. Uh, Chris, uh, so, uh, thank you so much for taking your valuable time to be here. The, uh, the passion that I have is about the sound and the sound of music and the geographic areas that it's come from, the Memphis sound, the Detroit sound, the Nashville sound, the various sounds that I know that you know about. 
But can you talk to us a little bit about the Louisiana sounds that you've been affiliated with, the, the Allen Two Sounds, the Meters, uh, the Zydeco, and others? What, what do you what do you think about that, and what the future might hold for that, in, in, at least in your company? Well, I can I can I can talk about it a little bit. It's a little sad thing in a way to talk about because it's about Robert Palmer, who passed away last year. But <clears throat> um, Robert Palmer. Uh, I first met in a club in, in London because I'd been asked to come and see a band and, uh, which was led by a trumpet player and I wasn't really that keen but I went anyhow. And then Robert and his wife sort of came into the club and they were incredibly glamorous and I wondered who these people were. And it turns out that he was a singer and then I heard him sing and I was just blown away by how well he sang. So I was interested in signing him immediately, but the only way to sign him was with the band. So I signed the band. So I sort of waited, waited it out a little bit. And then, um, and then sure enough, he came to me one day and said, um, you know, I think I'm going to leave this band. So I was thrilled about it because I really was, was, you know, was wanting to sign him. But he then decided he wanted to join another band. So I had to sit through this other band <laughs> for a little bit. And then eventually he came to me and he said, um, OK, I'm ready to do something on my own. And he came down here. And I said, well, what, what, who, where do you, want to go, what do you want to do? And he said, I want to come and work with Alan Toussaint. And he came down here and he made his first record, is the best record he ever made still, called Sneaking Sally Through the Alley. And he made that down here with um, Little Feet and uh, Alan Toussaint. And, and then we also released, we licensed from um, Marshall Seahorn um, the meters at one time. And the meters, the meters, you know, uh, I mean, they're just, the, I mean, this is the greatest music. The meters with the original drummer, I hope I'm not saying anything wrong anyway, but the, the, uh, <laughs> was just the greatest music, the greatest, absolute greatest rhythms. And then um, Buck, Buckwheat Zydeco was, I came, I was here at, um, in Metri in the studio in, in Metri and, and did a record with, uh, with him then. I've never understood honestly why the music from here has not reached a wider market because it has, it has a, a unique soul, it really does. And it's not a, it's an overused word soul and everything, but it really does, you really feel it here. And um, I don't know why. The future? I think the, the future is always, you know, around the corner. Some guy <laughs> comes from somewhere, some girls come from somewhere, they, they have something just unique. That's what's so wonderful about the, the music business. It's, a, it's an incredible uh, place to live your life because you keep, uh, you get older every year, but you keep dealing with 20-year-olds every year. <laughs> <laughs> it's like college teachers. <laughs> That's Chris, true. you know, one of the um, aspects that we emphasize here in the program is ethics. And you strike me as a very ethical person. Could you talk for a minute about the importance of ethics in the music industry? Well, I think it's important in anything, obviously, but I think it's really important if you're dealing w with artists. Ar artists, are, see, when they sign to you, they are putting their life in your hands a little bit. You know, they're putting, you, you're in charge of their life for a little bit, or their hopes. You know, and you you have to think like that. You have to think like that. If you don't think like that, you know, you have to think like that. You just have to think like that. So, <clears throat> I guess once that's the cornerstone, then the rest follows. So. Well, thanks very much for being here, Chris. We appreciate it very much. Thanks. 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 Thanks.